Okay, welcome back to my channel, Maybe Between the Pages. My name is Taylor, and today we have another fantastic episode of Page Chewing to talk about the upcoming horror, grimdark, fantasy anthology, uh, The Anatomy of Horror. Uh, there are 12 contributors in total, which will all be linked in the description down below. There's going to be some amazing indie names that you know. But today we are graced with the presence of four of those contributors. We have Ella McRae, Lisey Conley, Ryan House, and Tim Hardy with us today. And of course, my wonderful co-host, P.L. Stewart. <laughs> uh, so I would just like to get started by giving you four a chance to introduce yourselves and just say kind of what you do in the writing world, what genres you usually work in. Uh, just give us kind of a, a touchstone for how to think about your body of work. Maybe if we start with Lauren and then just kind of go in a, a circle, <laughs> if that works. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Lauren. I write under the name L. L. McRae, uh, and I typically only write epic fantasy. Uh, I have two series. My debut is The World of Lenaria, which is dragons, airships, and sky pirates. And uh, my current series is uh, very creatively called the Dragon Spirit series, uh, and that's Dragons, Curses, and Corruption. Um, you may have read or at least seen The Iron Crown Around. Um, and my uh, contribution to this anthology is much more in a dark fantasy phase than a, a horror phase. Uh, the body part that I wrote about was bones. Okay, you want to go next, Lee? Hi there, I'm uh, Lee C. Conley. Um, I write horror and I write sort of grimdark fantasy as well, so no one's really sure whether I'm a horror writer or a grimdark writer. Um, a bit of both, perhaps. Um, I'm uh, most known for my Dead Sagas books, um, it's like zombie apocalypse in a fantasy world type thing. Um, and I've done a lot of um, short fiction over the last year or so as well, so um, mostly horror though, to be fair. Okay, maybe Tim, if you'd like to go next. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm Tim Hardy. Um, I'm probably described myself as uh, probably a dark fantasy writer so probably my most well-known work is is Hall of Bones and the Brotherhood of the Eagle series which combines um, uh, I suppose a, a Vikings feel with, with Game of Thrones is probably my, my shorthand for describing that uh, and my latest book came out earlier this year that was more of a political fantasy uh, set in the Middle East in an African inspired world and that was called uh, A Quiet Vengeance so the, the anatomy for me was a bit of a departure again in terms of trying to stretch my writing and, and moving into actually horror itself. Uh, that's not something I've ever done before. Wonderful. Okay, and Ryan. All right. Uh, yeah, my name is Ryan. I'm uh, my. I've got two books. One's called The Steel Discord. It's a steampunk train heist, and the next one's called The Alchemy Dirge. It's sort of a, a noir with a merchant and alchemist. And then I moved on to a different, well, a standalone book called Red and Tooth and Claw, which has become my most popular book. It's a wilderness survival fantasy horror that takes place in the Neolithic era. Uh, and then my story for this one is uh, also very much in that same sort of fantasy horror vein. And that seems to be something I've been working on ever since. big fan of stories that have cross sections of both fantasy and horror. So as soon as I heard about this anthology, I knew <laughs> I had to eat it up. <laughs> You've all sold me on your stories already. But we do have some um, comments that I'd like to get up. Esme is here just for the time being. Uh, good afternoon, just popping in to share how damn excited I am for this anthology. You and me too, girl. Uh, never backed something so fast, I can't wait. Have a wonderful chat. And then just before, it sounds like she might have to go um, at some point, so I'll just put up her other comments real quick. I adored Lee's story in Skybreaker, Tales of the Wanderer. Yes, fangirls, the two of us champion that anthology as well. <laughs> yes, and hi, Charlie, uh, who is here. Hey there, hey, Charlie, thank you for joining us as always. And we also have uh, Tim here. Yes, Lee Conley absolutely loved the Dead Sockies. All right. So as we can tell with all of these different contributors, there being 12, but even within just you four, you write in so many different genres and you have a lot of bodies of work to your name already. So what was kind of the, the point of inspiration for all of you to come together for this anthology? Like, who came up with it? Where was the, the origin of it? Anyone can take it. <laughs> I'll have a stab if um, 
uh, because I think this is partly PL's fault and he's staying very quiet in, in the corner <laughs> there. But I, I understand you were the instigator of the original the original idea. I think that's he shakes his head. Um, but I think more um, I think more more recently, Holly Tinsley has or HL Tinsley is the right writer name she run, run, writes under. Um, she's really been the driving force for the project. So it was Holly that actually assembled the team and, and Holly that kind of brought us to together in terms of a writer she thought would be a good fit for the project. So um, although it's a group effort, I think really you know, Holly's been the engine room on this but really for the last what, 12 months, I think it's probably fair to say it might even be longer now, maybe more like 15. So yeah, Holly's been the, the one that kind of made it happen. And I think more importantly, keep kept making it happen as, he, as we encountered various bumps along the road as well. I can't believe it's yeah, PL. I'm really, yeah, I was um, going to say PL. You do have something to say? <laughs> no, this was this is uh, this is as as Tim uh, so aptly said. Holly is was the driving force behind this. Um, Holly and I had we Holly and I had bantered some ideas about about world biology, but um, the great thing is is that um, you know Holly is exceptional at um, you know kind of networking and bringing people together. And um, you know, I did help out a little bit with that, but but really, this is again, this is Holly's baby. Baby, but you know, uh, anything like this is because of the uh, the authors involved and the caliber of authors. It's just, I mean, as you can see, it's just phenomenal. And not all of them are here today, but um, yeah. So so my small part was perhaps reaching out to a few authors um, on more on Holly's behalf and seeing if they were interested. And thankfully, they. They said yes, so that's my tiny contribution to the anthology. Other than writing the foreword, which I'm very honored um, that I did. But um, as I understand it, uh, all the authors participating, including uh, the ones on screen, have done a lot. Uh, you know, an anthology is is isn't an easy thing to compose, and I think uh, everybody probably had their area of expertise. Maybe we can hear about that later on because bringing the whole project together, it's not just the writing, obviously, right? There's a lot of logistical things that are involved and. I'm sure all of you played uh, played a part in that. So yeah, but so my part was very minuscule. So humble as always. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, pardon me about that. <laughs> so uh, you were all brought together by well, PL is downplaying his his part, but uh, Holly as well, and. It was, as you've all said in your intro, kind of a new aspect of writing for a lot of you, bringing in the horror uh, and kind of adding that to the more dark fantasy that you typically write. So I'm kind of curious, why were you as individual authors interested in writing a cross section between horror and fantasy? What about horror interests you? Or as a writer, what does horror kind of mean to you uh, that got you interested in writing a story with that kind of intersection? I'll take that one first, if that's okay. I mean, one of the, I mean me and Holly worked together on Skybreaker, um, and I think I'm um, not well known, but known for, um, for for splicing together dark fantasy, grimdark, but in a horror style. So as soon as, as soon as this one came up, I was straight on board. I was very excited for this one. But um, I think I've always wanted to, personally, I've always wanted to write fantasy, and I always started out writing fantasy, but I, I read a lot of horror, I watch a lot of horror movies, and it, it just always, all my stuff has just ended up being horror. So it's just horror set in a fantasy sort of vibe. So it's just, it's purely, purely by, I, don't, I never set out to be a horror author. Uh, I just, I just seem to be one. <laughs> but um, but my love of fantasy is strong, and most of my stuff is set in a, in a fantasy world or, or a sort of a historic fiction sort of stuff. So. Um, so for me, it was quite different. Um, I actually just checked my DMs and Holly first reached out to me in April of 2022. That's how far back this has gone. Um, and I consider myself uh, an epic fantasy writer, adventure fantasy, kind of whimsical, lighthearted stuff. So when Holly was like, oh, yeah, I've got this dark fantasy horror anthology, I was like, this is, really isn't my wheelhouse, so I'm not sure. Um, so the attraction for me probably came from... Uh, the challenge of doing a short story, because I write very long books, and the challenge of writing a genre that I don't really, um, haven't really explored before. So kind of um, that creative challenge appealed to me. Um, and, you know, it's my first anthology. There, there's a lot of new things there for me. Um, and being part of this kind of group of incredibly talented authors um, and 
kind of all being in it together as well kind of gave me that confidence boost to to go with it um and the feedback's been great you know a lot of us read each other's stories um and it's kind of opened up a new way of thinking about writing for me that I perhaps hadn't really considered before um which definitely seems to be seen in some of my newer books as well so it's definitely like a growth thing um which is you know benefits me as a writer um and I think uh it's it's a nice way of trying something different that you're not necessarily known for that you may not have had the opportunity to write before. Um, and I really like that. Yeah, if we just pick up on that, I think in my experience is a bit similar to, to Lauren's actually. So I think with, with dark fantasy, it's not a huge, quite a bigger step is probably where, where Lauren was coming from with their, their sort of work. But but yeah, I think just trying something different and trying something new. And if you want to be a writer, if you want to progress as a writer, yeah, I think it's really good to sort of try new things because it doesn't really matter if it doesn't particularly work but actually you know just giving that giving that a go generally speaking if you stretch yourself you'll, you'll be surprised at what you what you can do and that, that was certainly my experience uh, i think the other thing as well I've, I've just really enjoyed working with the 12 authors and also with sarah chorn as well so first time i've been edited as well which has been a slightly that's a new that's a new experience for me i'm normally a self-editor so uh, giving up a little bit of control and allowing somebody a bit more creative creative input has, uh, was a, yeah, was, was a good experience, but it took a bit of getting used to actually, because it's a different way of writing for me. So yeah, I think for me, it was a lot of it was about that personal growth as a writer, really. And what about you, Ryan? What, what kind of inspired you to take on this project? What about the, the cross section of horror and your typical uh, genres kind of spoke to you? Uh, I suspect I was brought into this because my my last book was a horror fantasy, which is exactly what this is all about. Um, but it was a good change. Um, so my my story in this is completely standalone from anything else I've written. So trying to basically make a world and a cosmology and all of that fit into less than ten thousand words was a lot. But it was you know it was, it was a great challenge. It's a great way to progress and kind of imply things rather than, you know, going into a big full like, explanation like you might have the chance to do in a novel, that sort of thing. And uh, also leaving that sort of stuff ambiguous really helps with the horror aspect because it's the stuff you don't know about that's really gets the creep going on. I can say also from an experience from a reader's perspective, having people blend those genres and having them work together helps me grow as a reader and realize things that I might like. Hearing you guys talk about growing from a write, uh, writer's perspective. Um, one of the contributors to this, Zama Akhtar, is the first one that I read that really was heavy on horror in the fantasy uh, genre. And that got me hooked on the idea of cosmic horror. So he, he's to blame <laughs> for that. <laughs> but I think as a reader, something that really excites me about it is I can't wait to see other things that I might like about the different genres. So I think we're all kind of growing together in that way. But to get a little bit more specific than the overall arching genre of horror, the catchphrase for this book, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it is, uh, what do we fear and why do we fear it? right? Because it's called the anatomy of fear. So this concept of fear, it's quite nebulous, but it's something that we all experience in life. You can't go through life without feeling it, right? So I'm curious, working with this idea of fear, which is so different for every individual person, did you kind of delve into your own experience with it when you were working with, with the story to see what how you wanted to explore it? Or did you take it as a more overarching theme? How did you deal with that kind of that not not the word not vibe that's not what i'm looking for that theme of the anthology i mean i don't mind diving on this because i have quite strong opinions on, on this particular subject so <laughs> one of the things that i have always explored and I, I find absolutely fascinating is the concept of fear which is probably obvious if anyone's read any of my stuff and then, couple that with i think the hardest thing to pull off in book form, in, in, in written form, is, is is fear. So a book that genuinely scares someone is like the Holy Grail. You know, like I've read, all, you know, a lot of the so-called scariest books ever, and they were fantastic books. But, you know, none of them have you trembling quite as much as, say, sometimes a movie with the jump scares and things like that. So uh, my my mission in as a writer, one of my missions, is to write something that, it, that genuinely scare you on, you know, on the page. Um, now, 
fear, say it's, it's a subject that I write a lot about. So I often think what scares me. Um, so, I mean, one of the themes in, in the Dead Sagas books is things that watch you. So, you know, when you're lying in bed at night and you think, is something watching me? You know, is something out looking in the window, is something in the corner of the room. It's those little things that you know, I find you know, you know, actually sort of freak me out. So I try to relate anything that I find genuinely scary. Um, I try and put on the page, you know, um, a bit of a trigger warning, but like, obviously I've got kids. So anything that happens to kids, I think absolutely terrifying, you know. And so I, I'm i terrible to my characters. I will literally do those things to, to the characters in my books. Um, so, you know, the poor parents in my books, oh God, you wouldn't want to be at all. But um, so any, anything at all that I find genuinely freaky, that's what, that's what, that's the theme I, I, I try and roll with generally, so. Well, fear is subjective, but I got to say the idea of someone watching you from the corner is pretty universally terrifying. <laughs> like there's a reason the monster in the closet exists in pretty much all different cultures. <laughs> so what about, what about anyone else? Yeah, take I, uh, I also had the whole, you know, parents trying to protect their children and maybe not being the greatest at it as a thing in mind, because that is, I think most parents' big fear is not being able to protect your children. Um, so not only not protecting them, but sort of causing the issue is a big part of the story that I wrote. Uh, it's, I mean, it's it's not a phobia kind of fear where it's like you're completely shutting down. Uh, it, it's a very different kind of fear, but I think it's a very common fear for anyone with children. I'm just going to chip in there. I've, I've, um, I, I'm, I'm in the process of proofreading the getting the final version ready now, which is just by the, as an aside, is, is ready. And that, that's my biggest fear is this thing actually never being ready. So that's uh, starting to weigh, weigh heavy on my shoulders. Uh, but we, we're getting close now. But having, having looked at all of them, I think it's quite, you know, what do you fear is quite an interesting question for those 12 authors because they've done it in very different ways. Like, like Ryan and, you know, Ryan's mentioned that, that sort of fear of, I suppose, protecting your family but also causing your family harm it is one way it's gone. And uh, bear in mind, the, the brief was actually 12 different parts of the body. So mind, you know, uh, skin, uh, teeth, very, people have taken various parts and, and used that as the, the, the seed for the idea. But um, that could easily have led to like 12 stories all about body horror, which is kind of what I thought it might be when I first set out. And I, I personally can't really, I struggled to write in that way. So I, I, I kind of went more in a psychological way. And actually that's the, the breadth of the stories is, I think, one of the most interesting things about this, actually. Some people have gone for a, a very body horror heavy kind of slant to it. Others, it's much more subtle and much more um, sort of psychologically driven. Uh, and sometimes it can be you're just waiting for something to happen. Uh, sometimes for like, you know, 90 percent of the story, wait, you know, you know, something's about to happen and then it finally kicks in. And that that also is a bit, like, I suppose, the, the, the writing equipment of a jump scare. You know, it's going to happen but you still jump when it does. So I think the author's done a great job actually in giving a wide range of voices and a wide range of interpreta interpretations to what fear fear means to them. Um, I know some of the, the authors have, have kind of, I think here is Zamel in particular, his story is, is, is particularly memorable. I know that's come from his own particular fears. I My story completely different is I had to imagine something completely completely new um, for that. So again, people have taken the personal experience and chucked it in, or, or they've just pushed the boundaries and sort of gone with an idea and seen, seen where it's got to. And, and I think that's the thing that's most exciting about the anthology, actually, is it's, it's 12 very, very distinct voices. And I think, yeah, some people it'll be stuff you expect them to write, and it's great. And other people are like, wow, that came from <laughs> that came from you. I can't believe it. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's... Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, fear can mean anything to anybody. And actually you've got 12 interpretations of it in the pages of, of the anthology. Just no to quicker way to sell me on an anthology than to tell me that I'm going to get something different with every story. <laughs> so please continue, Lauren. My apologies. No, no, no. Um, I just kind of wanted to say on that and, and kind of add on to what Tim was saying. Um, like for someone like me who doesn't really read or watch horror and certainly doesn't write it, um, I, the way I kind of approached it was thinking about how fear can be very different. It can be like a creeping dread. It can be just the tension throughout that kind of intensity. It can be the th that kind of thriller. Um, I mean, I've watched films that aren't horror, but I've been like watching it through my fingers because of that like physical tension. Um, and I think the way I approached it, because much like Tim, I um, uh, had to create a whole new 
world for it. Um, there was nothing existing that I could write this story in because the, you know, thematically it's nothing like it. Um, but I think I just kind of focused on the idea of being vulnerable. I think that's when we're scared because we're vulnerable because maybe something's happening and we can't do anything about it, which even if you don't write horror is probably something you've experienced and then leaning on that in terms of how you build a story from that. Like, when did you feel most vulnerable? When were you most powerless? When uh, were the stakes so high because of that? And kind of um, focusing on that rather than going for like a body horror or an outright horror from some of these uh, very experienced dark authors um, because that wasn't something that I had any experience in doing. Um, so I kind of, I looked at it that way from like what type of fear I wanted to try and put on the page. Fascinating. <laughs> Go ahead, Pio. No, that's incredible. I guess for me, um, because I have it on my TBR, you know, the massive TBR that, that never ends. Obviously, I have have Ryan and Lee's work uh, on my TBR. Just haven't gotten to them yet. I have read, um, you know, uh, Lauren and, and Tim's work, on, of course, and exceptional. Um, when I think about reading Lauren's and Tim's work, um, you know, yes, um, there there are some elements I, I find that are a bit horror in both your works. I don't know if you'd agree, but I do find there's some tiny elements, Tim's in particular, um, where there is definitely I think I think some things stray into that that horror vein. But for me, I'm wondering, you know, especially as a reader, I feel that there there is a definitely a connection or correlation between fantasy and horror. Some of the elements in a lot of great fantasy books stray into the to the horror, and you know maybe perhaps with Ryan and Lee's work, it's a bit it's a bit more overt. But but I do think that subtly uh, there is some uh, in in Lauren and Tim's, especially in Tim's. So for the but for those readers who are like, ooh, I love fantasy, I don't read horror. Uh, you know they've read perhaps all of your books, they love them. Uh, of course, if they're reading Lee's and Ryan's, they're probably pretty good with horror. But for those who uh, who perhaps aren't. What would be the pitch? What, what would attract someone who is more of a fantasy reader, doesn't really read horror per se, but what would make them want to read this anthology beyond just, okay, I'm a fan of, of Lauren or, or Ryan's or Tim's or and Lee's and, you know, I'm going to read this book because they're involved, but what would make them read something if they're more of a fantasy reader? What would make them want to want to read something that's kind of like that genre blurring? Crikey, I really wish I'd thought of an answer to that question before you asked it. Um, <laughs> what would, I suppose, um, I guess what you're going to get, like I said before, that the 12 stories are different. So you, you have got stories that very much lean, I think, more into a fantasy setting and kind of stay quite safely there. So I think... Um, I think it's it's definitely pushing the darker boundaries and that there's no escaping there's no escaping that so you know if you don't like horror I, I, you're probably not going to enjoy this anthology if I'm perfectly honest with you because it's kind of setting out to be a horror a horror anthology read but you have got a range and a range of style and, and tone uh, I think um so yeah I, I suppose if you like I think if you like your fantasy dark you'll be quite comfortable here. Uh, I think if you like, um, if you like exploring lots of different worlds, you know, you, you'll, that, you'll definitely tick that box. So um, Lauren mentioned uh, you created a new world for yours, didn't you? And I, I was the same. I didn't have anything that, um, that kind of worked for this kind of brief specifically. So I, I created a new world again, like Ryan was mentioning, you know, that challenge of, gosh, 10,000 words, I've got to create something new. So you'll, you'll get all those world building hits and all those kind of things will, will, will come across very strongly. But yeah, at the end of the day, um, if you like cosy, epic, high fantasy, um, well, you know, give it a try and see. But uh, you, know, um, you, you will go into it. Will take you into some darker territory. That there's no there's no escaping that because of the nature of of the brief and what what we set out to do. But does that answer your question, Bill? Yeah, no, I, very, very, very well, Tim. And you know, you, although it wasn't uh, wasn't pre prepped, you did it exactly. Definitely not pre prepped. It was made yeah. on the spot. Yeah. yeah, no, you did a great job of answering. I guess. What that also makes me think about, and I'm thinking about what Lee was saying, that you know maybe perhaps more so for for Lauren and Tim as opposed to to Lee and Ryan who write more in that vein. It sounds like writing horror is hard, like it's difficult. And as Lee was was alluding, that it's difficult to really scare people in on, on the pages, right? Rather than seeing it visually, rather than watching a horror movie. So as, for all of you, but in particular for 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 Lauren and Tim. Did you find writing something more, you know, 
in your face horror, more overtly horror. Was that was that hard? Was it difficult because of you normally sticking essentially to the the more fantasy uh, elements? Mm -hmm. Um, for me, it was it was difficult, but all writing is difficult. Um, I <clears throat> strangely found writing some of it quite cathartic because you know you're you're pulling on personal experience. It's a way of exploring a difficult time. It's a way of exploring something that scares you. That's why you're writing about it because you think it might you know bring that horror fear element to somebody else. Um, which I guess also I guess to add to what you and Tim were just talking about, that might also be why someone might want to read some of the stories because it's an exploration of something that you maybe don't normally get to do. And there are 12 different stories. So, you know, probably chances are you're gonna find a few of them that you you like. Um, but yeah, very difficult. Um, I, since finishing it, I haven't reread it and I don't ever really want to reread it. It's kind of like, a, it's done, it's out of my system and now it's, I'm moving on. Um, and even when I was reading some of your guys' stories, there were a few that I had to stop reading partway through because it was just a bit too intense for me. Um, so that's, you know, challenging something that you would normally shy away from is quite difficult. But then, you know, when you get into that kind of writing zone and you're just picking out emotions and picking out little details, that's where I find the joy in writing anyway. So you're just kind of turning it from a more fantastical, wondrous idea to something that's a bit darker. Um, so difficult at first, but cathartic. And once you find the flow, it's not too bad. Um, but not something I would want to do full time. I don't think I have it in me to do that full time. Can I um, add something on to, um, to, to PL's questions from what Tim was saying? So going back to would fantasy readers enjoy, you know, um, this anthology. Um, and, and Tim's absolutely right. It is very much darker. I think there is a draw for even those who are curious, right? So we have 12 names, right? Pretty much all 12 names have been in SBFBO. So, you know, the fantasy self-published blog, you know, um, blog off. These are some of Indy's brightest names. And we've got others amongst us who are award-winning authors with, say, like myself and Ryan. We cross over a lot of horror. But there is definitely a draw to people, someone who's read Lauren's work or Trudy's work, or, and, and they think, oh, you know, I love that, you know, and but here they are doing something else. It's definitely come see them do something else. I mean, they may not necessarily like horror, horror as much, but there are definitely some fantasy voices here which are worth listening to. I mean, every, all the stories are, you know, fantastic. Um, it's, and, and I think there is still, even if you're into your high fantasy and your cozy fantasy, it is Halloween after all. Come have a go, you know? <laughs> Well, that, that's fantastic. And I think there will be definitely a draw because, and I mentioned this briefly before uh, when you're asking about my contribution, the, again, the caliber of authors in, in this anthology, um, they all have their own level of recognition, obviously, but many of them have been in the self-published fantasy blog, as Lee has alluded to, and, 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 and have their own following, their own audience, and are fairly well known, especially in the in the indie sphere. So yeah, I think that alone is is indeed huge draw and and no you guys brought up some excellent points because what i was thinking about when i was prepping for this this podcast was that hey you know what and and i hate picking on 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 tolkien but let's let's pick on tolkien because he's easy to pick on um you know i mean if you you've read tolkien i mean uh sauron was meant to be terrifying you know the nazgul was meant to be terrifying you know um you know the orcs were meant to be terrifying and perhaps they're not written in that that overtly, you know, scary way. However, they're they're meant to be scary. So I think in in all fantasy, there there always has been in traditional fantasy, there always has been that element of horror. And if if you have a big baddie in, in your in your in your work, if it's a good versus evil type type uh, fantasy, especially the the bad person's supposed to be scary to a certain degree, right? Um, and and I that that's what I was thinking about. That I think there definitely is that intersection. In almost every uh, epic fantasy work, you know that that there is a horror element, but it's not something that I really thought much about until I was uh, I was going to speak to all you folks. So with with Taylor, so that that's something that's been on my brain recently. So again, for those of you um, who are like, ooh, you know, horror anthology, you're looking at oh, but yeah, you know, Warren McCray, Tim Hardy, Lee Collins, it's probably gonna be good. Think about the fact that some of the books you've probably read, if you're almost exclusively an epic fantasy reader. There's, there actually is somewhat 
maybe I was stretching a bit, somewhat of a, a, a scary horror element in there. So. This is a bit more of a specific question, but the hearing the original prompt from you, Tim, made me curious. The fact that it started with a part of the body, thus the name anatomy of horror. Uh, was there any particular like body part when you heard that prompt? You're like, oh, I need that. I need to work with that. Did any of you have that kind of reaction? I see Lee nodding his head. <laughs> yeah, we, we were not, you know, very politely, because we're all authors, and um, many of us are British, we were very polite, but we were all politely like <laughs> wrangling over our favorite body parts. And I went in, I, I did I, and obviously things are watching you, you know, it's a theme I'm, 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 I work with. Um, so I was like dead set on that. Um, but yeah, we. Um, I think it all worked out fairly well, didn't it, guys? I mean, um, everyone kind of just picked their part and it, it, was, yeah, it wasn't that much, you know, we, we kind of like all, I think there's one or two of us that sort of switched around and things, but um, generally it all settled quite nicely. Everyone had some really fun ideas and um, it all seemed to just gel together really nicely. And we also were allowed to pick whatever body part we wanted. So it could be absolutely anything. We have like mind, we have like, you know, skin, all sorts of different things. Um, so then also there's a lot of body parts to go around. So, but yeah, I wasn't sure between hand and eye. I'm just thinking, did anyone do hand actually in the end? Just have a look. I think I don't think they did. I think because yeah. you were oh, no, kind of keeping it to your reserve. Bjorn did. Bjorn did. Yeah. Oh, did yes, he did. Yeah, That's yeah. right. Yes, yeah. there was a trade at the end. But there was a lot of horse trading and body parts. It's fair to say I was because I was slow off the mark. Um, so whilst lots of people were going for the choicest morsels, um, when I got down to it, I, I was serious at one point, thinking to myself, I'm going to have to write about sentient dandruff because there is no <laughs> other. There is no other body part left to me that I can. I, I can was going to say pinky it. toe, <laughs> but you got the dandruff might be a bit better. <laughs> um, but in the end, it turned out ears well, ears were available, and uh, I went with that. And I, I must confess, um, I did struggle with that a little bit at first because uh, until I flipped it around and thought about it, I thought, well, if you don't, what, what horrible thing could happen to the ears? I suppose it's quite limited. But actually, if you change that to a fear of sound, which is what my book is about it's actually sound has been weaponized and is used against people. So if you're able to hear, actually you're incredibly vulnerable to this particular, uh, this particular um, evil force basically. So, uh, so it clicked in the end, but and sometimes maybe that's a good thing that if you get put under pressure and all the others have uh, run off with the, 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 choice, the, the choices part, so you can, you can still make something from even a very small idea. Sentient dandruff <laughs> might come back, it might come back, but, but not in this anthology. <laughs> Can I just say, I'm really glad Tim picked ears, though, and you'll have to read it to find out why, but I'm really glad you actually ended up with ears, man. That was it. <laughs> I just have this image of like this cadaver and all these authors <laughs> just joking, I want chop it up and elbow each other another way to get, no, I want that part. And, you know, yeah, it wasn't as polite as Lee makes out. It really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Talk about that body is... horror. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I, I do I, I do have uh, some specific questions as well um, about, I touched this a bit uh, when we were talking earlier that, you know, writing an anthology, it's a marvelous thing. It's also a lot of work and not just the work of just writing each individual story, bringing it all together, the funding. I mean, there's so many other um, elements that, that need to kind of just click just right for a project of this scope to work. So. Can you all talk a bit about that? Like, like, did you were you all assigned individual duties that you had to take care of to make to make things uh, come together? And how 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 much work was involved, and and how did that all all evolve? Well, there's actually two. Holly is our project manager. She spearheaded the project. She put it all together, obviously, with a little bit of help from PL that he is uh, he's not admitting to. But um, then we then had a uh, and there's two of us here, which are actually on the the production team, as it were, myself and Tim. And um, we were assigned certain roles. Um, and um, yeah, it's been it has been an awful lot of work, especially in the last couple of weeks, isn't it, Tim? We have read that book uh, a lot, <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of the graphic design and a lot of the formatting and things. So every tiny little error that's found, we have to go back and reformat it. But it's it's been really fun, though. But, um, yeah, there is a core little team. But I'll let, I'll let Tim talk about that. Um, yeah, I, suppose, I, mean, I think everyone's, I think it's fair to say everyone's done a, played different parts in this. So, you know, it's, it's been a, it has been a, a genuine team effort across the board. So just, um, I suppose, the inception of the stories and the creation, you know, people were put into beta teams at that point. So all of us have jointly collaborated to a certain extent just to get the story to a certain certain stage 
and then say, you know, people like me doing the proofreading, for example, we, we've read the lot, but, you know, certainly every group has read a lot of the whole thing, if that, if that makes any sense at all. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you're right. It, 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 you think to yourself at the beginning, well, if there's 12 of us, it's going to be really easy to write a long book, isn't it? Because you've only got to write 10,000 words and that, that side of it is actually quite easy in the sense that you have only got to get that, that far in. But then, yeah, I think the, the challenge is really twofold, but there's one is, is there a project? And that was the, the Kickstarter. So, you know, if you're going back to the beginning of the year, we weren't even sure we'd have the funding to do this. Um, so that was a, you know, that that's a, a new experience. You know, as an indie, I'm quite used to, just, you know, keep it cheap, bang it, <laughs> bang it out. It's quite straightforward. But this sort of thing would involve a lot more moving parts that were outside of my control. And that was definitely quite um, uh, quite a challenge. You know, running a Kickstarter for the first time, which is really what Holly's main lead, that, that was an epic effort, actually. Um, but then, yeah, you've, you've got to sort of, you've got to because you've got 12 people to keep pointing in the same direction that that takes an awful lot of organizing as well and you know getting things down to style guides for actually the final version you know you know are you spelling it us or uk or, or both you know those all those things need to be uh need to be teased out and sorted out where, where you would never have that problem if you were writing a book yourself from start to finish um so it's not it's not for the faint of heart but i like i think i said at the beginning the fun bit of this actually was collaborating with the other authors and you know I do think I've grown as a result of being part of the project because I've been able to see how 12, you know, 11 other people would tackle that exam question. And that's made, given me lots of ideas. I mean, I've come out of this. I think my short will become a novel off the back of this. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of run, run with myself further down the um, further down the line. That would never have happened if I hadn't got on board and, and done this project to begin with. But yeah, it, I think people on the outside think it's, it's quite a straightforward exercise, but actually it, it's, you know, again, I have to say, I mean, she should really be on this call, shouldn't she? She should be on every, she should be on every call because, um, you know, we, we, she had just had done a fantastic job at making this happen. And I honestly don't think we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are now if she hadn't been constantly wrangling and getting this, getting this moving forward. Um, I could talk for ages about this. It's been busy. It's taken, I know for Holly, it's basically been, this has been her writing job, if you like, for a long time. Um, but yeah, you know, things like sorting out artwork, the editing we've got an audio production it's the first time i've been audio recording you know got an audio version of the book so all those things individually are quite big projects lump all together it, it's it's no small no small thing i was just adding because you reminded me of something there tim one of the things i've really enjoyed i say it has been working with everyone but there's been people i mean i went into sbfbo like five years ago four years ago so you know it's like sort of falling off the uh, the current sbf Yo, train, I can't say it, train a little bit. There was, there's been a, a couple of people, like I know Sh like Sean quite well and, and like Tim, I know, and like, you know, I spoke to Lauren before and Holly and a few of us, but it was really nice getting to know someone like uh, Crystal, who I didn't really know as well. So it was really nice having a back and forth with them. I remember me uh, messed, I mean, I'm a big fan of Zamel. Uh, so I, I messaged him straight away. I was like, really glad to be working on this. And it was nice to actually open up a bit more of a dialogue with like, a bit of networking in a way, but it was like, you know, working with people that I, I admire and it's been, and I didn't actually know from my time in the SPPO world, and it was, it was, it's been really, it's been really awesome. Um, really, really, I just want to add that in there. So. Can I also add something? I just want to say it feels like we've been properly spoilt by how collaborative and supportive this entire project has been from start to finish. Like, if you think about being back in school and trying to do a group project and what a car crash that always is, because you've got someone trying to hang on and, and to the reins and other people d going off doing their own thing. We haven't had any of that. We've, we have 12 very different people. There's no big egos. There's no, oh, this is the way it should be done or, you know, you're doing it wrong or it's not good enough or anything like that. It's been nothing but positive from beginning to end. Um, every time anyone's had any issues, multiple people have been there to offer feedback, support, suggest ideas, that kind of thing. And like we've all definitely been going in the same direction together, um, definitely led by Holly. It's, you know, she probably makes it look a lot easier than it is. Um, but it's been such a lovely experience that any fear, I think, or worries or concerns that any of us have had were very quickly um, put to bed because it's just been, you know, a proper leadership from the beginning um, and everyone can contribute with whatever ideas they have without fear of being shot down, um, which has been really lovely. Yeah, I mean, I can say as, you know, PL and I, you know, running page chewing organizing a lot of people 
time, you know, for us time zones, for you guys, I'm sure dates that drafts have to be done, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, but we do it because we love it, right? Everyone here is just full of, uh, of passion for what they do. Uh, but I am quite curious, Kickstarters are huge now, especially in the indie self-pub world. So of course, as a reader, I have my pick of the lot, really, <laughs> as much as my wallet will allow, which it's getting a little bit tighter with all these Kickstarters. But <laughs> I jumped on this one, you know, right away. And I'm curious for you guys, I know that Holly's probably the main person that wrangled everything and was the main Kickstarter person. But were you guys involved with the idea of the Kickstarter at all? Like, were you waiting with bated breath to get the funding? Or did you have any personal experience, you know, or any, yeah, personal experience with doing a Kickstarter? Because I know there's a Kickstarter version and there's going to be a non-Kickstarter version as well, right? So I'm kind of curious what was unique about that particular experience. Don't oh, all okay. sound off at once. <laughs> <laughs> it feels a long time ago, actually, is part of the problem. It's um, it, For me, it was my first experience of doing anything like that. And again, that, I think the... So I think tricky in terms of losing control and feeling, well, if, the, if no one backs it, that's going to be really embarrassing. <laughs> Apart from anything else, there won't be a project. So there was there was that side of it. Um, but yeah, I think it was, a, as, as Laura mentioned, I think it was the start of that collaboration as well. So that there was a lot of debate within us as a as a writing collective about things like, well, how do you structure the tiers? Has anyone got any experience of this at all? Know what they're talking about? It'd be really great if they did. Now would be the time. Um, you know, and just trying to sort of like pull together, you know, what makes a compelling thing for someone to back, actually, and going through all that. So that there was a lot of debate behind the scenes before the Kickstarter went live about how it would actually... Um, how it would actually work and then yeah as we sort of saw that it was actually going to get over the line which was amazing you know then well how do you stretch go what, what sort of stretch goals do you need those kind of things so i think that kind of set the tone actually for for what the project was like and i think that may, probably makes it slightly different from a typical kickstart which often there tends to be you know one author's driving their particular special product aren't they doing it this way it's it's a very different experience because again you've got to work collaboratively even on those things right from the get-go really so i think i think it set the tone which was good I just want to say, oh, say. we, we talk. Oh, um, I've got an echo there. So we talk about fear, right? And we're, but what we haven't mentioned is terror. And one of the things I was absolutely terrified about on this Kickstarter was, as Tim said, it wouldn't go. So I mean, I've seen Kickstarters come and go quite a, quite a lot over, over the last couple of years. Some have been very successful, and um, I've considered doing one myself. And uh, but I've always been, you know, like, well, if it just doesn't get backed, you know, like I'm quite a niche, um, like author, you know, in the horror fantasy, and it's not huge, you know, like. Is it even going to get back? Shall I even bother? So it was really interesting to actually see how it worked. and, and it was, it, But there was a genuine terror, especially counting down those last few days, like when we were like a thousand pound away from it or something. And we were like, oh, my God, are we going to get funded? Is this going to happen? So, um, but yeah, that, that was that was terrifying. And um, it was funny. <laughs> I, I think the anthology angle on that really helped, though, because you've got fans of 12 different people all looking into back it and all of that, which really helped. Uh, it was also, there was a bit of collaboration, as I recall, when we finally did hit the stretch goals and we're like, okay, what are we going to offer up as stretch goals? There was a lot of chat in the Slack about the different things we could be doing for that. So that was really good. Yeah, can you folks talk a bit about, because, you know, as Taylor mentioned, you have, you know, I, there's there's different parts. There's there's a Kickstarter element there. So what um, what is the anthology offering in terms of, you know, like, you know, if you back the Kickstarter, you get this. Um, you know, can you talk a bit about about all the the minutia of of? I know Lee's gonna gonna flash his covers. So, well, Tim, do you want to jump on as well, right? And I'll just flash things as you if you tell us, because I know you are quite on top of the um, the Kickstarter tiers and things. Um, oh dear! So that there's an assumption here. I'm on top of the Kickstarter tiers, um, and that, that is not. That is not the case. Um, yeah, yeah. So there are quite a few different um, different levels. I'm gonna, I'm not going to try and remember them all because I don't remember them all. But um, in short, so you can qualify for um, basic. If you've backed the project and you you backed it to the extent where you actually um, claimed a reward, you will get an exclusive cover first of all. Um, so as as Lee is now uh, expertly modelling in the corner of my screen, so you'll get the ex Kickstarter exclusive uh, either ebook or the physical um, paperback that we're producing at the moment. So that's probably the, the main 
the main reward. Um, in addition to that, we've, we've got quite a, so I think for people that want to go to the, um, on the physical reward side, we've got some custom made um, artwork and I think some specific um, stickers and things that we had, had commissioned and made. So um, we had um, an artist called um, Dawn Larder who um, came on board the project. So sort of midway through actually, we had a few different changes and um, having to rethink a few things, which was again, probably one of the biggest challenges back in the, the last, the, the more early stages of the project. Um, so Dawn's done some great artwork that people will get uh, physical copies of. Um, I, I'm in charge of, which is not a good news for anybody that's back to these tiers, I'm in charge of digital fulfillment side of things. So again, there's also electronic versions of these that will be doing the rounds as well, along with the ebook. Uh, and then for some of the, the higher um, tiered uh, supporters, we've also offered up um, some of our, um, our books uh, as part of a digital library. So um, there's like an entry level one, which offers a couple of um, um, uh, novellas up, written by um, Sean Crow and, and Crystal Matar. And then if you back to a slightly higher tier, you actually get access to a, a full library. I think it's about 15 books, might be 16, Lena, you know, you've chucked your latest um, in the mix. So we've got, uh, not, not from everybody, not everyone was in a position to do it, but, but quite a few authors were able to put on type first books of series, those kind of things up for free. So um, as well as actually downloading and getting the anthology, you're going to get an awful lot of um, other bookish material as well if, if you've gone that particular way. So, uh, and then I guess that the, the, the biggest the biggest logistical challenge has been getting, uh, we've got some book plates travelling around the world that we, so we're going to we're basically doing a signed edition as well. So that's ex pretty exclusive. I think it's about 130 people um, pitched in for that particular one. Um, so we have been sending these book plates basically around the world so that everyone can physically sign them. So we decided to do that rather than electronic signatures, um, which was, was that a mistake? I don't know. If, 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 if my, if that box arrives at Lauren's house next week, it will not have been a mistake. And if it doesn't turn up, it would have been a catastrophic mistake. We'll have to see which way it goes. Um, but that, that's been, so yeah, the people we were hoping as long as that doesn't, there's no mishaps in the post, uh, we'll have a signed edition that again will be mailed out to people in um you know later on this year all being well so uh, i think that probably covers everything have i missed missed anything well else? for the kickstarter it certainly is i mean there's, there's some really top rewards on that kickstarter but yeah it, this book is so awesome and we believe in it so much that we thought we can't just have this as a kickstarter so the people who have backed it they will get their their special signed slightly different cover version of it but we're also in um i'm not sure of the release date yet but after this Kickstarter's been fulfilled. It is going to go on general sale as well. Um, it's going to be on ebook. There's going to be the audio book that RJ Bailey, who a few of us know fairly well because he's done our books. Um, fantastic narrator. He's done the audio book. That'll be available on Audible. Um, we have um, this is the general release cover. So it's this awesome red one. Um, it's a bit, it's actually a bit darker in the real one. This is the proof one. We've made it darker. But um, yeah, so it will be on general sale in all good bookshops. So book, book stores online. It'll be Amazon and things like that. Um, so but, but that'll be a red cover. And yeah, so you will be able to, but if you miss the Kickstarter, you can still get a copy of this. Um, it's just, yeah, it won't be the super shiny purple one. It would be great if people bought it. <laughs> Definitely. It would be that well, that's actually perfect because we had a, a comment earlier from John Saxon saying, when can I get it, please? So this general release, when can people get their, their little mitts, their paws on it? <laughs> Uh, I, we we are so close to being able to uh, confirm that. And it would be great if we could have done it on this show, wouldn't it? But we can't because we're not quite there. So we, we've just been going through the, those final proofing elements at the moment. So I think the honest answer is if, you, if you're a Kickstarter backer, you're likely to get the, the e-book and so on is going to be coming to you this, uh, when, when are we, September. So it'll be early October is looking is looking good. Um, I think that probably then works into a general release date around November time, but we will be confirming that shortly. And again, if you're a Kickstarter backer, that will obviously um, get notified to the, the supporters that way. Uh, we'll be putting that out on social media as well. So uh, it's uh, just getting that final five percent has been a little bit of a challenge, as as Lee has mentioned. But we are we are you know knocking on the door and being able to do that. Um, I've also just because Lee was talking, I've just remembered as well that obviously the audio version is going to be great. R.J. Bailey is recording that, who is quite a well-known uh, voice artist. I think done quite a few um, people's people's books on this call. Actually, uh, there is also a, a little exclusive reward for Kickstarter supporters. Of an uh, uh, actor actually did his own recording of um, his his story uh, and i listened to that and it scared the living daylights out of me basically he does a great performance on that so again if you if you pitched him for that particular award that'll be coming 
uh, fairly imminent as well. So uh, it's a lot, lots of good stuff to come. But then, yeah, really important to remember it's part of general, it's on for general release as well. And uh, yeah, look out for those dates at probably November time. Well, either way, that's not long to wait. So that is so very exciting. Uh, we also did have a comment from John saying you all deserve a pat on the back <laughs> for all of your work. Also, Kareem is here. Hello. Welcome. Am I late? A little bit, <laughs> but that's okay. It's available to watch later. So no worries. Um, yeah. So, uh, so we don't know the exact release date, but you can expect for, you know, PL and I to be boosting that when it comes out, because I'm just, I'm so excited for this to, to be in the world. <laughs> I've been waiting for it. And I will say from a backer's perspective, uh, the feedback has been very wonderful, very much on time. And so all of that kind of anxiety and all that work you guys talked about, it, it looked very smooth <laughs> on this side. So it didn't come off that way at all. <laughs> it was not, but we will we'll draw a veil over that. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. I just, so quickly, I know that, you know, we can't give too much away here and, and we don't have release date, but because we have the special access to some of the authors from this amazing anthology, again, without giving too much away, can you just kind of give a bit of a, a bit of a, a teaser about your individual stories, what they're about, your individual body parts, uh, and perhaps why you chose them? It sounded like a bit of a, a bit of a fisticuffs over or who got what, but obviously it was amicable at the end that you all got your your own uh, part. So can you can you each uh, talk a bit about that? Okay, so my story was based off heart. My original plan for the story was very different than what it ended up happening. So I kind of had to make some adjustments because it, well, um, it wouldn't have been long enough for this sort of thing. <laughs> But uh, my story ended up being about a mother who fakes her death to keep her family safe, only for something that looks exactly like her to take her place pretty much immediately. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I I have what we all said that fear is subjective, right? So for me, the thing that scares me most is like ghosties, <laughs> like little demons and ghosties and things like that. So it sounds like your story is going to be a bit of a challenge for me. <laughs> Yeah, I love those doppelganger, like supplanting, you know, someone with someone else. Yeah, I love that stuff. Okay, that sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. Tim? Yeah, I was touched on this earlier on. So I, I got the, the, um, the, the not unwanted ears to sort of work with and say, turn. So my story is basically around. Um, I suppose a world where fear has become weaponized. And how do you actually, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you sort of deal with that in terms of um it's one first I suppose it's one first layer of um of fear because actually when that weapon is used against you it then creates um you know put, puts people into a very difficult position i don't want to give away too many spoilers this one i'm sort of um, hedging around it a little bit but uh, but it kind of brings you into sort of um aspects of you know family in peril so that that's very much the the core of this story uh, and then I suppose also on underestimating your enemy. So that th this this particular group goes into a situation which they know is dangerous, but actually what they find is that they're woefully unprepared for what they then encounter and then and why it's happening to them. So the, the story kind of unfolds with, with that kind of um, that kind of a uh, uh, steer to it. Uh, it's, it's my first attempt at writing in the sort of gas lamp fantasy kind of setting. So it's an eighteen hundreds uh, kind of um, kind of feel. Uh, so again, we quite crowd a new world to, to write in, but but yeah, um, sound is all around us. So actually, if that can be used against you, how do you how do you get away from that? The, again, the story provides some answers, which I don't want to get into, but uh, it's uh, it's not straightforward. I think it's fair to say. Well, that sounds awesome. That sounds that sounds awesome. Can't wait to do that, um, Lee. Hey, so. Um... What can I tell you about my story? So just to shatter the hopes of any of my Dead Sagas readers, there are no zombies in my story, um, so unlucky guys. But there is some pretty intense um, gory stuff, so you'll love that if you like my stuff. Um, so that's fun. Mine is also set in like a 19th century gas lamp type thing. It's also one of my first attempts at that. And when Holly um, messaged me, um, I was just like, well, Holly's put this together. It's, you know, She's well known for a gas lamp, and a few of us 
maybe had a similar vibe because it's, it's quite nice how there's a, there's a good couple of stories in there that kind of really go nicely together um, in this Gaslamp theme. But mine is about the eye, as I mentioned earlier, about things watching you. So I won't tell you too much, but it's about a cursed eye um, that watches you. And uh, it's also kind of got this noir detective vibe as well, this 19th century detective vibe. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to leave you guys to enjoy it because it's, uh, it's a fun one. But it was great fun too. Okay, that's a nice tease. That's a nice tease. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. And Lauren, what what about your story? Um, so I kind of approached it from my experience in writing epic fantasy. So it's set in the, a kind of a, a classic medieval style world, not much tech, but lots of magic everywhere, sorcerers. Uh, spirits, that sort of thing. Um, so I picked Bone um, because I wanted to go with the kind of the fantastical idea of, you know, there being um, magical power in certain body parts. Um, you know, you very often read stories about, you know, king's blood and stuff like that. Uh, so I went with Bone because I thought it was the closest to something that I was familiar enough to write about, um, particularly uh, when bones break and the power that's released with that and the kind of you know, the corruption, corrupted spirits, that kind of sort of vibe when that happens. Um, so it's set in uh, a place where bones break a lot uh, and exploring the fear of, uh, from a child's perspective of being in that environment surrounded by this kind of darkness, um, feeling very vulnerable, feeling very helpless, feeling very scared, um, and whether or not any um, power can be taken from that, whether or not that's a good thing. Um, and it's just going for more of a creepy atmospheric vibe rather than outright horror. There's no real gore or anything like that in mine. Um, but it's just kind of going into like human fears in a very fantastical setting. Um, and that's what I was trying to do with mine. Well, you guys mentioned that all of them have, you know, different feels to them. And from what you just said, that's very, very clear. <laughs> oh, I'm just, I'm so excited. <laughs> um, I don't know if, if PL had any other specific questions um, because I don't want to take too much of your time. So I wanted to pass the baton off to PL to make sure if there's anything else that you wanted to, to ask before. I did have one uh, quick one. So I know that uh, some of you were, some of you were involved with the phenomenal uh, Skybreaker. Again, Taylor and I, we, we loved that anthology and congratulations. I believe it was nominated for a big award. I, I, I think, Oh, Lee can talk. I want to give Lee a moment to, to mention maybe what, that, what happened there. Yeah, so on this, um, on the Anatomy of Fear anthology, um, so as I mentioned previously, me and Holly worked on Skybreaker from Nordic Press. Um, we recently got nominated for a British Fantasy Society Best Anthology Award, which was really, really cool. Um, we were we got to the shortlist, we got to the final six, but unfortunately it was taken by, oh, I can't remember the name of the anthology, a fantastic book, um, uh, beat us to it. But we were shortlisted for it, which is absolutely great. And um, as I say, it's been a real pleasure working with Holly again on this one as well, because that was a really fun team to work on. So. But yeah, yeah fantastic. You. Congratulations. That is amazing. What an accomplishment. But quickly, yeah, my question was, I know at the end with, um, with Skybreaker, there was, um, without spoiling it, there was a common element tying all the stories together in that particular anthology. Is there something similar in in um, the Anatomy? Just curious in the uh, Anatomy of Fear. Is there something similarly in you know for you? I guess being the the person. Okay, that's... so I mean, Skybreaker had this 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 particular portal running theme, and it was very much uh, a huge part of our brief. And we had to work in these certain elements into every story, and it required it was quite heavily controlled in in that sense. But what we wanted from Anatomy of Fear, the the common running theme is the body parts, and to give us more uh, freedom and, and really sort of um, harness the each individual author's particular styles and, and writing, you know, and writing style, um, we kind of give it's a little bit more free, isn't it? So it's it allowed us to have all these different vibes, all these different kinds of ideas, all these different feelings, you know, and, and different concepts of fear without having too strict a brief. So it's not as strict as the Skybreaker brief in the sense, you know, that there isn't we weren't forced to include anything in our stories other than purely the body part it had to be related to the body part that's our running theme on this one which i must say it was 
I mean, I really enjoyed Skybreaker. It was fantastic to work on. It was really nice having that in-depth sort of really connected. Everyone's stories connected. I remember me and Jenny swapped little bits. So there's like a, a certain bits in the story that are in other people's story. And we really collaborated on that. But on this one, it was really nice just to let loose. And we had our one theme and we just got to go for it and, and, and really sort of get creative. And that, that, was, that was really fun. But yet still this, this combining theme. Um, so it was really nice to work on, uh, on, on this one, to be honest. So. Well, I had one final question as well, which was a lot of you have talked about how either, well, I think for Ryan and Lee, you're more in your your wheelhouse, working in your wheelhouse, but the experience of working with other authors, reading other authors' work, or in Tim and Lauren's case, writing outside of your typical genre, you guys have all talked about learning something. So I'm curious, from your perspective, what's one thing that you've taken away from this experience that you're going to use going forward in your writing career? Take your time. <laughs> I, I sprung that on you, so that's excellent. You know, I can play the Jeopardy. I can play the Jeopardy music in the background while you guys think <laughs> that one through if you'd like. <laughs> it can be a, a writing, writing technique, technique or, motif, or motif, whatever. Whatever. Uh, a, a big thing for me, I guess, this was my first anthology I was in. So the ability to, you know talk with everyone, get that feedback. Uh, I got a lot more feedback on this than I usually do. I usually have a few beta readers I send my stuff out to, but having the, the, the sheer number of people look it over and kind of say like, hey, you could do this, you could do that. Uh, very, very helpful. Uh, also, like I say, said earlier in the show, uh, trying to get everything into that uh, that word count that, you know, rather than having the full novel to kind of expand on every single thing. Just leaving things a little bit more ambiguous, uh, which I, I I do in some of my novels too. But uh, I really had to force that into this to make the world make sense in a short amount of time. So that was also a really really good thing to learn, and I'm definitely going to be using that going forward. Okay, so for me, I mean, one of the things I've been really focused on in the last year or two, which some of the Dead Sagas readers have been a bit. Um, patient with, let's say, is I've been really concentrating on short fiction. So I recently just did a writing degree um, just to really improve my craft. And it's very, very focused on short fiction. So doing this was an addition to the short fiction I've been, been doing recently. But it really helps boil down the story. So you have to, you can't waffle on for ages in a novel length. You really have to be concise. Every word has to count. And then um, it's been really nice to further hone that those skills. And then now the people that have been patient waiting for book three, the Dead Sagas, the, um, I mean, a lot of the way the Dead Sagas is structured is it's lots of little stories and overarching um, 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 storylines, but there's a lot of, so there's a couple of single chapters where it's just a, that, just a little mini story, like set in. And thing. So using the skills I've developed from, from all the anthologies and short fiction recently and my degree and things like that, putting that all into into the, the, the new novel and making it really concise and really, really sharp. Um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out compared to my very first one, which was prior to the degree. Um, but yeah, that's it's, it's been uh, quite fun learning that. Also, the other thing I've learned, and this is probably unique to only me on this one, is um, also I did a lot of the formatting and I've um, further increased um, sort of the professional standards of, of, of formatting. Um, Things like embedding the fonts and things like that, and it's 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 been really nice to uh, to. I did my uh, short story anthology last, uh, collection, released that last week, and then this one as well. So working on two short story collections at the same time and working on the ebooks and things has been um, a, a refreshing learning experience. It's been bringing my skills up to uh, up to date, basically. So that's been really fun, to be honest. So. Either Tim or Lauren or. I'm going, to, I'm going to unmute myself to force myself to answer this question. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, I think, you know, um, Ryan touched on it earlier. I think the, the collaborative nature of this um, has been the thing that's probably helped me learn more. Uh, I think I'll, I'll single out probably being development and getting um, Sarah Chorn's developmental edits in um, was, was particularly useful for me because she was able to sort of just apply a, a critical eye and say, this isn't clear. Or I think the bit that I, think I always remember is sort of saying towards towards the end, she says, "You haven't, you just haven't turned the knife enough in this part of the story. You know, you're actually losing some of the emotional impact it should have at this particular, at the basic, at the climax of the whole thing." Um, so, yeah, I think it's yeah, learning learning how other people are pre learning what what other people see in your work, and then 
uh, being able to apply some of that critical learning to yourself is, is quite, you know, again, it's for me, this has been a huge writing improvement journey, definitely. Because as Lee says, you've got a short story, you can't waste words, you've just got to get it down, you've got to nail that point and get that, get that story told in the way you want to tell it. But then don't miss an opportunity either because you're rushing. And actually, there are some times when you need to pause uh, and just allow that story just to expand a little bit and potentially breach Holly's word count by a couple of hundred words but that that was fine apparently um so you know going 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 that way and i think just yeah it, when you work together I, I think yeah it just improves the output i think is, is the bottom line for me and that, that was a bit uh, as indies we could be quite proud of what we what we're doing and saying we know best and yeah you know, it's, it's great that you can tell your voice exactly as you want to tell it um, but there's also the other side where actually working together, you can often bring out the best in each other. And I think for me, that's what this anthology has really been all about. It's about bringing out the best of each other, cheering each other on when it wasn't always in our comfort zone. And I think, yeah, we have, as Leah has said before, we have got a really good book out of this. It really is cracking. So uh, pick up a copy. There you go. That's my learning experience. And there's a call to action as well. I just want to quickly jump in there and agree. Sarah did such a great job as editing all of our stories. Well, I mean, my story, at least. I haven't seen the edits on everyone else's, but uh, she really was very good at uh, finding the exact weak points, the places where maybe you're not clear, things like that, and making sure that you've got the emotional through line going on and all of that. She was just fantastic. So, yes, yeah, thank was, you, Tim, for reminding me to shout her out because she did a great job. Yeah, it was a dream. Uh, Sarah was one of those dream editors that I've wanted to work with for a little while. Um, so it was really nice to, to finally get to work with Sarah. Uh, I just want to add that before Lauren jumps in. So. Sorry, Lauren. Uh, no worries. I'm sitting here like Tim, keeping myself muted, trying to think of something to, to answer with. Um, <clears throat> I guess for me, it's, it's a bit more of that author growth. Um, because I have dedicated time to, you know, something darker, it, it may have actually adjusted what I feel is impactful in when in my own books whereas before I would probably shy away from some of the um aftermath of bad things happening or scary situations because I think of myself as a light-hearted writer like when people are like, oh what do you write about I'm like the kind of books you'd like to enjoy by a fire when it's raining outside with a cup of tea and just you know some escapism um whereas these with my later books that I've written since my short, I definitely have explored and stayed with the darker things a bit more than I perhaps would have, consciously or not. Um, but a lot of the feedback I'm getting from, for example, my latest book is it's been considered dark epic and I would never consider myself that. But then when you think about it, some of the things that I'm now writing about definitely do kind of linger on those more negative emotions and they're just as impactful as the fun ones um so i guess growing to accept the whole emotional scope and being a better writer because of that um and this story this this short has definitely been a key part of that i'm, I'm proud of the fact i'm sure ryan agrees and we're proud of the fact that we've corrupted lauren and brought her to the dark side yes <laughs> i did to toe in it <laughs> I appreciate you all being good sports and, and working with that question, but I just want to reiterate to anyone watching, you know, they're, they're being very humble and talking about how they can improve, but the caliber of this book is like, if you've read anyone's individual work here, you know the caliber that we're working with. So I don't want anyone to take that as this was an improvement project. <laughs> like that's not, that's not what it was. They're just being very humble <laughs> in answering my question. Um, just wanted to put this comment up real quick. I'm really disappointed that I didn't get the chance to pre-order this amazing book. I, I understand that feeling, but you will get your hands on it soon, right? You'll be able to. So um, like I said, PL and I will be blasting that date out whenever you guys have it available uh, to share with the public, consider that boosted. Uh, but before we go, um, talking about how you're gonna apply all these things to your future careers, where can people find you for those future works or the, the works that you've done in the past? If someone watching this is inspired to look at your backlist or to see what you are creating personally in the future, where can they find you? I guess we can, anyone can take that order, but you can shout out, you know, the books that you've, you've already written, books that you're thinking of writing, any other projects that you're working on, collaborative projects. Um, this is the, the platform to, to let us know. Would anyone like to go first? 
Go on then. I'll I'll sh I'll be the shill. And then I'll, I'll I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, best place to look for my stuff is um, on my social medias or on my website. So, leeconleyauthor.com. Um, now, the, the things you you're going to want to read really are Dead Sagas Book One, The Ritual of Bone. Um, a couple of times bestseller in it. I think it won a really little award as well. So it's it's, not, it's check, worth checking out. And then the sequel, which I actually think is way better, but people disagree with. They're like, no, the first one's, I don't know. You have to read them both and decide. Uh, third book will be out real soon. And I've got uh, quite a few um, short stories out of them. Uh, so we've got obviously The Atomy of Fear, which is going to be fantastic. We've got Skybreaker, which was mentioned before. Um, I've got a couple of sort of um, Lovecraft mythos style uh, horror stories um, from Nordic Press, which is called The North Sea Cycle. There's two two books that one's coming out soon and um, check that out as well. Um, I think they're the main ones. Uh, oh, and of course, my new my new book, my short story collection, um, Once More Into the Dark, which I released last week. Um, go check that out as well. Lots of all, some of my best short fiction is in there, except the story from this one. Um, all the other all my other best short fiction is in, in that collection. So um, if you like it, go check it out. please. Thank you. I just wrote down those names. Don't mind me <laughs> typing over here. <laughs> Anyone else who would like to take the next one? Uh, I'll, I'll follow Lee's lead. Um, so yeah, you, you can basically find me on social media fairly easily just by looking for Tim Hardy author. Um, so I've got a website which has all my social media links in, which is uh, timhardyauthor.co.uk. So fairly easy to find and you can then link me in from, from there. I'm on um, x or twitter if you prefer still twitching slightly at that one but let's just move on um facebook and i'm also dipping my toe in that uh, blue sky as well so you can, you can find me in all those places um if you like book reviews and things like that i've also have joined the page chewing team i probably should have mentioned that at the start but i've remembered it at the end so i am actually a reviewer on the page chewing website and i've been putting up uh, reviews on a fairly regular basis over on there so you can also see which uh, books i'm enjoying and things like that um and yeah i suppose in terms of uh, going on the website, you'll find the links to uh, this anthology plus my, my current uh, current works. Probably my next big project is going to be finishing off the Brotherhood of the Eagle series. So book four is the final book. So that'll conclude the saga that started with Hall of Bones. Uh, that book's Broken Brotherhood, and that will be out in 2024. Come hell or high water, that is happening. So that that's a big project. Uh, I will just also mention something else. Um, we, we're also just about to announce a bit more activity around another anthology project I'm working on, which is the advent of winter. So some of us are involved in that. So that's a, a slightly expanded version in the sense of, an, of the anatomy of fear with about 24 authors coming together to get some, um, uh, get some short stories written on, on a winter theme. So you'll be hearing more news on that in the coming weeks. So that'll be, uh, that'll be keeping me busy as well. I saw Dominic books uh, teaser for that. And I was like, Ooh, notify Ooh, me on yeah. launch. Sorry, wallet. <laughs> You know, it's already happening now. So <laughs> maybe Ryan or Lauren or whoever is after the next. Um, I have actually taken a step back from social media, so you can't really find me anywhere. Um, I'm trying to focus on getting the books done. So when the books are done, I will probably hop back onto social media and start stuff up again. But right now, I need that time to get work done because I've got a full time job and children, and it's I need time. Uh, so my, if you want to look for my books, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the thing, but the Steel Discord, Steampunk Train Heist, The Alchemy Dirge, uh, which is sort of its sequel in the same world, different characters, and then Red and Tooth and Claw, which is my survival horror fantasy, uh, which you can find on all of your lovely websites when you purchase books. Um, so I'm also on Twitter slash X until such time as it implodes. Um, I'm also on Instagram where there's various book related posts, Boris related pictures, who's my dog, uh, and cooking and baking because I need to still pretend that I'm a cozy author while I'm slowly being corrupted. Um, you can access all of that uh, through my website, which is just llmcrae.com. All my books are there. You can, buy, you can buy the physical copies, signed copies. I've got book swag, prints, uh, artwork prints, bookmarks, stickers, that kind of thing. Um, I have not got my other series in arm's reach, but you may uh, see Iron Crown and the new Shadowgate. Shadowgate is the new one, the one that's apparently corrupted me. I mean, Shadow is in the title, so I guess it's kind of to be expected. 
Um, the ebook of this came out back in April, but the physical one is just released yesterday. Uh, the audio book is populating across retailers now. It's on all of them except for Audible, which takes an extra month because it's Amazon. Um, again, RJ Bailey is the narrator for that series. So uh, you get to hear him for the anthology, you get to hear him for the Dragon Spirit series too. Um, and I'm in a number of discords as well. So um, you can probably find me online if you don't look, you, you don't need to look very hard. Can I also, just we say, had this comment yeah. from Karim real quick. Poor Lauren, what did they do to you? <laughs> if you look in the back of Anatomy of Fear, um, all the author's websites are listed there as well. And in the um, ebook, you can click on um, a link and it will take you to everyone's social media pages as well. So if you get a copy, you should be able to find us fairly easily at the end of that book as well. So. I will also have everyone's um, like main hub. So most people's uh, websites and things like that will all be in the description down below. And at once the Anatomy of Fear goes on sale, the link to that will also be down below to, for where you can buy it. Um, and I want to give also my wonderful co-host, P.L. Stewart, <laughs> a chance to tell us you know, about, you are also an author in your own right. Tell us about your series, where we can find you, all of that. <laughs> Uh, P.L. Stewart, uh, usually you find me beside Taylor on page chewing, either her channel or my channel. Um, I'm also on X, Sitter, Twitter, X, whatever it is. I've also dipped my toe into Blue Sky. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks for the, thanks for the invite. Uh, a lot of, a lot of great to see a lot of people there who've left, uh, Exeter. Um, Instagram, Facebook, not as frequently, um, you know, and the website www.plstewart.com. My series is the Drowned Kingdom saga. Three books currently out: um, The Drowned Kingdom, uh, The Last of the Atalantians of Lorne King. The fourth book is in the editing phase. That's called A Lion's Pride, and I just want to give a special shout out to uh, Taylor, who's agreed to uh, potentially provide some cover fodder for that book as well. So she'll be one of the first people reading it. Uh, so thank you again, Taylor for doing that want to uh, give a quick shout out to um you know especially holly tinsley um you know she is the architect of this entire project um you know and, and again she is an incredible author uh read her stuff um you know her vanguard chronicle is amazing spfpo finalist for we made my fashion shadow holly's phenomenal uh she put this whole thing together i'm sure all the authors would agree that this project would not be taking place without uh, holly um also just a quick shout out the other authors who are not here on the United Fear, Shock Crow, Produce Guys, Bjorn Norrison, Jacob Sanex, Chris Matar, Holly, of course, B.A. Bellick, and Zamil Actor. As these authors have uh, mentioned, these are the authors who aren't present on this podcast. We couldn't fit them all in. There's limits to uh, StreamYard, and of course, everybody's very busy, but um, they are phenomenal authors in their own right. They all, many of them award-winning and have been in a part of SBFBO, so check out their works as well. Second, everything that PL just said. <laughs> uh, if you are watching this on my channel and somehow don't know who I am, hello, my name is Taylor. Uh, my booktube channel is Made Between the Pages. I am also an assistant editor at Before We Go blog. Um, I do page chewing with PL. You can find me on his channel or on this channel. Uh, and I do reviews on Goodreads as well. So you can find me there. All those links are always in the description of my videos. That's kind of like the best place to go to find any of my other stuff. But thank you so much for the four of you for joining us. I wish we could have had everyone, but as PL said, time constraints, <laughs> StreamYard, we couldn't. But I really appreciate having you guys here uh, to represent the, this upcoming anthology. I've said multiple times, but I truly mean it. I'm very excited for this. Uh, so I, I predict five stars. <laughs> so um, I really you know, appreciate your time. Yes, thank you, Lee, <laughs> for the for the final show off there. Uh, everyone in the comments, thank you so much for stopping by. If you're watching the the replay, go ahead and let us know in the comments down below. If you got the Kickstarter, if you're planning on buying it when it comes out, we'd love to hear your thoughts. But uh, for now, that concludes episode 53 of Page Chewing. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.